Galen Maxwell started her criminal trial facing six criminal counts. She left with five convictions. Now she's down to three. Judge Allison Nathan threw out two more, calling them duplicative, saying that they didn't need to be there. And now Galen Maxwell and her defense team, they've only got three more to go. We're going to go through the actual order. Quick refresher, Galen Maxwell seen here from the trial. She was in her face mask, as was really commonplace back then with Judge Allison Nathan up there on the bench. We're going to take a look at the 45-page order, just some of the highlights. From the U.S. District Court out of the SDNY, Southern District of New York, filed April 29th, 45 pages, but we'll go through some of the highlights. Judge Allison Nathan, we saw her previously, is writing, saying, In 2020, Galen Maxwell was indicted for all sorts of stuff with Jeffrey Epstein. We covered that trial in depth. It was 13 days, a lot shorter than many people speculated. Jury deliberated over five days, came back guilty, five of the six counts. Two of these were convictions for substantive violations. Other three were charges for conspiring with Epstein. For example, counts one, three, and five, because they are multiplicitous or duplicative, meaning that they all charge the same offense, therefore an entry of judgment on all three of them. It's sort of stacking them all on top of one another. It would violate the Fifth Amendment's double jeopardy clause. Second, she says, under the rules of criminal procedure, that the court acquit her of all counts because there's any evidence for a rational juror to find her guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Kind of a standard motion or claim there. Third, the defense and the defendant moves to vacate counts 1, 3, 4 under Rule 33. She says that there was a conviction based on the constructive amendment or variance from the indictment. In other words, they convicted her for something, for some type of an offense that wasn't detailed in the indictment. Fourth, says that they all should be vacated because the government intentionally and prejudicially delayed its prosecution, which, I mean, you know, obviously, it's like 20 years old. So here, with one exception, the motions are denied, all of them. Judge saying, oh, that's, sorry, nice arguments, but no. Rule 29, challenging all counts, is denied because the jury's guilty verdicts were readily supported by the evidence, witness testimony, and some of the documentary evidence that was admitted at trial. So there was plenty there. This is similar to sometimes you hear a failure to state a claim or failure to you know, basically make a substantive argument is not enough to bring a, a certain type of lawsuit. Same type of thing here in criminal law, saying that there's just not enough evidence. Nobody could, in their right mind could take a look at what they heard, and the defense would make all sorts of their supporting arguments, you know, their credibility arguments, the conflicting reports between them. They're saying that any reasonable jurors just wouldn't be able to put this together to come up with a conviction. The judge is saying, that's ridiculous. There's plenty here. We had four different victims. Enough there. They write further, those counts of conviction match the core of criminality charged in the indictment presented by the government at trial on which the jury was accurately instructed. So the jury instructions were properly matched to the underlying indictment and the underlying indictment matched the testimony that we heard at court. So they all are sort of in sync with one another. In other words, if the indictment says, that you are somebody who stole a car and at trial, they talk about you, you know, damaging a light post as a result of you stealing the car. And there's no real conversation about you actually stealing the car, but only about the damaging of the light post. You go, well, that may be true. All of that may be true, but I'm not on trial for that weirdos. I'm here for grand theft. And you're talking about criminal damage. Get out of here. And you could say, it's not even remotely true. It's there. And the jury is saying, well, I don't like what happened with that damaged light pole. So I'm just gonna convict this person for the underlying auto theft, but you can't do that because that's not what the person was charged for. That's the argument that Galen Maxwell's saying that the indictment doesn't really match the evidence presented at trial. The judge said, no, they all match. Evidence match the indictment. The jury instructions match the indictment, which matches the evidence. The defendant's contrary claim of constructive amendment or variance from the indictment rests on an implausible or speculative interpretation of a single ambiguous jury note. In addition, the court concludes that the government did not intentionally delay its prosecution and, in any event, the defendant's ability to prepare a defense was not prejudiced by any delay. And remember, this sort of was delayed a lot. There was all sorts of COVID nonsense going on. And we covered a lot of the pretrial motions where every time that there was even a remote mistake by the prosecution that... Galen Maxwell and her defense team was just filing motions, like, how dare you look at me incorrectly? And it was a lot of fun to follow. The court does conclude, however, this is where we see a couple counts of slow whittling away 
of some of these charges just slowly evaporating. And then you fast forward a few years and you say, that's weird. Galen Maxwell's in Las Vegas. What's she doing there? That's strange. And she is free because the same thing that happens that happened in Bill Cosby. The public forgets about it. Everybody stops paying attention. Slowly but surely, the wheels of justice grind on. Appeals happen. We have a remand for some reason. Oh, whoa, weird. She's down to one charge, and it's a weird small charge, and she's out credit for time served. She's out there doing cartwheels with, I guess, Bill Gates or somebody. I don't know. The court does conclude, however, that the three conspiracy counts charge the same offense, and accordingly, they are multiplicitous. The court concedes that count one is multiplicitous with count three, but argues that count three and count five nevertheless involve distinct conspiracies. Court concludes that count five, like count one, three charges defendants and participation in the same decade-long unlawful agreement. So in other words, the umbrella of the one conspiracy sort of includes the subset of all of the counts. So if th they're enough like one another that it doesn't make sense to charge them as distinct separate counts saying that they are multiplicitous. It's kind of like they're all kind of the same thing because it's all part of the same big, long scope of horror. Defendants, continuous co-conspirator Jeffrey Epstein, of course, involved. The overarching conspiracy, which, as the government argued and proved at trial, employed a single playbook. So it's sort of one core conspiracy to groom and abuse constitutes a single conspiracy offense with just the number of different victims. Because the Double Jeopardy Clause prohibits the court from imposing multiple punishments for the same offense, the court will enter judgment on count three alone among the conspiracy counts. This legal conclusion in no way calls into question anything, of course, she was found guilty of this three times over, that the defendant is guilty of conspiring to entice, transport, and all that stuff with Jeffrey Epstein. So the judge saying, yeah, I got to toss two of those because they're too much like the third one, but I'm not making a judgment about this. One by one, charges continue to just fall off the tree, don't they? Very, very convenient. We see some of the nuts and bolts, the legal conclusions happening here. Paragraph one, the court grants the multiplicity claims. We have uh, two pretrial motions that they were arguing. They go through the applicable law. We see here, we've got some second circuit cases. Here we see some common overt acts that some of these various charges all actually have very similar underlying activities, actions that support the criminality underneath. As the government notes that there were overt acts for counts three and five, they were distinct, but they say this goes in favor of the government, but only slightly. A number of the overt acts listed in count three could also be prosecuted under count five. And so you see how they're so similar enough, according to the judge, that they're identical enough that they really resulted that listing both conspiracies is just a function of timing rather than two distinct conspiracies. It wasn't like Epstein was doing two separate conspiratorial things. They were really the same thing with underlying uh, similarities between the different people involved in the different locations around the world. Here's a little bit back to the analogy between the light post and the theft of the car. Here you can see the defense is arguing, saying that there's constructive amendment or prejudicial variance. In other words, the jurors are hearing something differently than was charged in the indictment. And so they can't convict Galen on behalf of that erroneous gap that they filled in. It says Galen seeks to vacate her convictions on one, three, four, the Mann Act counts pursuant to rules of criminal procedure, it says Galen contends the jury convicted her of intending that Jane involved herself or was involved in activity in New Mexico rather than New York, resulting in a constructive amendment of the indictment, or in other words, a prejudicial variance. For the following reasons, the court disagrees, denies the defendant's motion on that basis, saying that the, the indictment was saying it happened in one location, and then the evidence was presenting that it happened in another location. And the jurors were saying, well, because it happened in another location, it was sufficient to convict as though she had done it in the other actual location charged in the indictment. So a little bit roundabout way of communicating that, but that's what they're arguing here. Maxwell's defense says the jury note received during the deliberations revealed that the jury convicted the defendant on a crime in a different count from this core of criminality, saying that they were convicting her of count four. The jury found that she intended to engage in activity in New Mexico without finding that she intended for Jane to engage in activity in New York. She argues the court's decision to refer the jury back to the charge and the refusal to give the supplemental instruction was error. As a result of the error, says the jury improperly convicted her. The jury note in question was here. Count four, they asked, if the defendant aided in the transportation of Jane's return flight, but not the flight to New Mexico, 
where if the intent was for Jane to engage in the activity, can she be found guilty under the Second Amendment? After hearing from the parties, court said, unclear to what testimony you're talking about. Court said, at the appropriate course, refer the jury back to the instruction for the second element. Said the defense, not requiring, didn't need a supplemental instruction that they proposed the following day. Said it would have given the jurors an erroneous statement of law. Judge Allison Nathan summarizes a bit more for us here. Says the defendant had sufficient notice of the government's theory of the case. Saying Galen and her defense knew about this. Going to involve multiple properties flying all over the place conversation about one that's sort of closely connected to another says that you could have prepared a little bit for this to avoid any substantial pre prejudice. The indictment charged a scheme to do this type of stuff. And in service of the scheme, the indictment alleged that they groomed them for various things at various states, various locations. Jane had long recalled going to New Mexico, although she did not report any of this at, at this property until closer to trial. But the defendant had adequate notice of this particular testimony such that there was no danger of any prejudice. So, Glenn, you sort of knew this was coming. If the testimony was off a little bit, it wasn't exactly right, more or less. Judge is saying it was close enough. You knew here that they were going to be talking about different locations. And this slight variance was not enough to be prejudicial such that the charges should be overturned. We jump down to page 45. The conclusion from Judge Nathan says, for the foregoing reasons, Rule 29 denied verdicts, in fact, were supported by the witness testimony and the evidence presented. Court denies the motion on the constructive amendment or the variance saying that the government's evidence at trial captured the core of the criminality, matches the indictment. Galen not prejudiced by any differences there. Says government didn't intentionally delay. It wasn't prejudicial towards Galen Maxwell. The court also denies the defendant's motion based on the pre-indictment delay. Finally, the court grants the defendant's motions as to multiplicity. The court concedes the count one is multiplicitous with count three, and the court further concludes that count five is multiplicitous with count three. Count five, like count one and count three, charged the defendants in the same decade unlawful agreement. Therefore, those got to go. Accordingly, the court will enter a judgment of conviction on counts three, four, and six. Defendant's sentencing date remains scheduled for June 28th, 2022. Signed by Judge Allison J. Nathan, United States Circuit Judge, going up to the Court of Appeals soon enough. We'll start to see if there's any sentencing memos or letters or anything interesting that we can share right here on this channel. I hope you enjoyed this review of this case. Galen Maxwell's down to three convictions. We'll see if the other three just happen to float away, evaporate into thin air, never to be seen again like other things in this case. Well, my friends, I hope that you enjoyed this. If you did, I would love it if you subscribed before you got out of here, shared this with a friend or family member, and I look forward to seeing you on the next one.